I'm sorry, anyway. So I'm Matt Franklin, and I'm, uh, I'm going to talk to you about embedded experiences. And for everybody I don't know, hi, it's nice to meet you. Um, so it's like two of you. So today we're going to talk about, uh, I'll give a little bit of an introduction. We'll talk about what Open Social is, what they're doing currently, um, Apache Rave, and embedded experiences. And I promise all of those things will make sense when we're done. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm Matt Franklin from the MITRE Corporation. Um, I'm the current PMC Chair for Apache Rave. I'm an ASF member and I'm also an Open Social Foundation member. So, Open Social. Some of you may have heard of Open Social before. Um, some of you may not have heard of Open Social before. For those of you who have, you've probably heard it in the context of Google, unless you've been specifically working with Open Social in the last couple of years. Open Social is not Google. <laughs> and, um, it's a, it was originally started, the foundation was started by Google, but it's since moved on. And we're kind of taking it to the next step. So we're going to talk a little bit about, I thought I got rid of that animation. Um, we're going to talk about what open social is really. So open social is really two different pieces. It's a modular web application development framework. So gadget, widget, you know, whatever, you, whatever term you really want to use. Um, we're starting to call them apps in the open social space because that, that fits with every other app market and everything else that you have. Um, but <clears throat> open social apps are, have, you know, pretty much it's a simple manifest, HTML and JavaScript front end, um, a runtime HTTP proxy that lets you get back to, to back end services, it supports OAuth 1, OA, and 2, um, auth you know, authorization and authentication back to those services. And then a whole bunch of client APIs that get, get uh, allow you to do cool stuff like launch other gadgets, interact with them over a pub sub channel, um, and do, get access to, to data. It also is a specification for, for the social data APIs. So you know, per, first and foremost in this is person information. So you want to know uh, information about the person who's viewing it, information about the, the subject of the page, also who they're connected to. So in a business sense, this would be people they follow, uh, people in their organization. In a social sense, it's prob probably their friends, um, you know, get similar to, to a Facebook model. And also the activity streams. So we'll talk a little bit more about what activity streams are, but the most important thing to, to take home from this slide is that, that activity streams are a first-class citizen in open social. Um, we also have APIs for media items and messages and a, and a few others that are, are probably not quite as widely used as activity streams of people, but they do serve a form of function. I swear I deleted those animations. Um, so kind of what's the advantage of open social? Why would you want to develop something inside of it? So portability, right? Um, that's first and foremost with any type of widget framework. The portability across the different containers. So I can write something for, that works in Rave that also works in Jive or IBM Connections or any of the other open social containers that, um, that are accessible to me. Client integration. So this one's a really big one for us at MITRE. Uh, applications that have access to all the services via that runtime proxy that are on the network. So what you can start to put together is a composite user interface that does kind of integrates at the client level. So each gadget can access one or two services that it needs to to get its data um, and do what it needs to with that data. And then instead of having to do a big server-side integration and then render a web page like you kind of traditionally did, you can kind of bring those different components to the UI or, or component UI to the front end and let the browser just kind of render them independently and then use it, take advantage of the client-side APIs like PubSub to push messages and, and events around. Another huge advantage for us and that we use a lot is in the injection of uh, the runtime APIs. So as opposed to some of the widgeting frameworks that are out there, there's a government one specifically, where you, to include APIs, you literally have to, to reference the JavaScript file that lives on the server. Um, Open Social provides you a way to say, I just need this, right? I, need, I require this particular feature to be there. Let me have it. Um, and you do that as part of the manifest, it's very declarative. There's a lot of uh, runtime you know, efficiency, it kind of concatenates all the JavaScript together, sends it down as a single bundle. So this, theoretically and, and in practice, for the most part, should simplify your development if you're doing it right. right? So it gives you, you know, your code doesn't have to do a ton. It only has to do, take advantage, or the, it only has it's responsible for the things that it needs to, to get its particular function done versus some of the other APIs. Right, I don't have to, to work hard to go back and get person data. I don't have to work hard to make a you know create a pub sub mechanism. Right, I just say attach to the hub and you know send an event. So 
And then the next thing that Open Social is really starting to push towards is the concept of an in-context application. What this means is delivering, you know, you see people as an integration point. Um, a lot of that has to do with, with how activity streams are being used with Open Social now. <laughs> and what we want to do is, is deliver actual functionality to the users where they are, right? So wherever they are, whatever application they're in, allow you know, things like activity streams to transport applications around so that people can take advantage of them without having to switch context out to some new window or a different application. So what you kind of see is how open social has evolved from where it started as just the Google gadget spec out to where we're headed to, where, you know, what they call apps at the point of need, right? Um, you know, started the formal specification of servlets, portlets, you know, those types of, you know, big heavyweight specifications, kind of combining with the, the lighter weight, you know, model of, of iframes and what you kind of see in Facebook apps to start to put together HTML5 components and then now we're going to start to deliver apps at the point of need. So we'll talk a little bit about how that happens, and that's kind of really what an embedded experience is, so I'll get into that more a, bit a little bit later. But the, the overall goal is to kind of reduce the context switch. You don't want to take your users out of where they are and to, to you know, take some action on some other application. You want to be able to let them do it right there in line and move forward. And also, you know, this model really supports, you know, a development pattern that is pretty pervasive, right? So REST services are everywhere now. APIs are all over the place. Um, so taking advantage of those with just straight HTML and JavaScript web apps that run on the client side is, is really kind of one of the goals of open social in terms of supporting that. So this is fundamentally about open social and Apache Rave. Um, so Apache Rave is, is the project that I'm, I work on the most, but for those of you who don't know what Apache Rave is, which is like two of you, um, Apache Rave is a web and social mashup engine. Its job is to manage the little web widgets, right? So whether they be uh, open social or W3C widgets, it doesn't matter. Uh, could have additional ones as well if you wanted to. Rave's job is to make sure that they show up in the right place on the page and um, are consistently defined. We also support a lot of different deployment scenarios. So, so task-focused dashboards is something that, that we do a lot of with Rave, um, where you can imagine, you know, say you're the Department of Energy, and you have a big map that shows all of your smart grid stuff, and you have a bunch of widgets on the outside of that map that have context-based um, information. So whether it be, I click on, a, on you know, Aaron's house, and I see all the usage that he's had in the last month, and maybe I have a graph below that shows the usage trend over time, and then I see another you know, network graph to see how many people in his neighborhood that, that have um, similar usage. Right? All those types of you know, situational awareness dashboards can really take advantage of the lightweight widget model very easily. Uh, component web applications, so this is something we do a lot of at MITRE. We, we have recently deployed a really big application where we replaced our phone book, which the phone book at MITRE is about 15 different data sources all composed into a single a single web page. And what we used to do was make 15 different web service calls on the server side and then render out a JSP with all that data. So now what we do is just render out you know, via Rave the, the context and let the gadgets themselves go back out to the services and get the data and render. And we also have a, an, in, you know, an inter, intranet portal and an extranet portal that we're putting together on Rave. Um, the intranet portal we've had for a while, the extranet is new. But those are kind of how we get our users engaged when they you know, load up their web pages for the day. So core features. Um, open social supports via Apache Shindig. So we, don't, we didn't rewrite the book, right? We just took Apache Shindig and all the good stuff that they've done and integrated it. We support W3C widgets via Apache Wookie. So same model, right? We didn't want to have to rewrite a whole W3C widget container. So we just took advantage of what Wookie had. And we include them all, you know, very in, in a loosely coupled architecture. Uh, we Rave does provide some of the open social SPI implementations, so for activity streams and people, so that you know, kind of at least out of the box and have a starting point to work towards a, a kind of an integrated environment. We have a little bit of a self service application administration. Can get into the an admin section and set some preferences. We're expanding on that, yeah, very quickly. Uh, gadget repository, so some of you have seen widget stores and things like that, so this is the same concept, right? You can go into the gadget store, add new gadgets, add them to your page, things like that. 
Um, we also have support for inter-widget communication across the different types of widgets. So you can actually do PubSub from an open social gadget to a Wookiee widget, something that is kind of unique. Um, we do have a pluggable persistence model, so you can provide your own implementations of our repositories to get, you know, source your data from wherever you need to. And we have a, a pluggable, although probably a little overly complex right now, security model where you can um, you take advantage of Spring plugins. So Ray's support for open social is, uh, is you know, Ray, Ray itself, as I mentioned before, is widget agnostic. It shouldn't really care. But we do have a pretty good delegate model, and we, these providers provide some great functionality. Um, and anything that is useful in common, we've kind of abstracted out, so any widget framework can take advantage of it. Uh, but the open social provider specifically gives you your activity streams integration, uh, the open Ajax hub, intergadget communication, embedded experiences, and view targets, and open gadget. I'll show you what those are in just a second. So this architect the, the point of this architecture slide, this was done for an internal um, review, but the point of this is to kind of show that, that the red parts are pieces that come from you know, the providers themselves. So Shindig is you know, the big red box on the top. Um, we have a little bit of a red piece inside of Rave that just kind of isn't the adapter for that particular widget framework. Um, and then on the client time, <laughs> client side runtime, we have the, we use the Shindig common container to launch the widgets and gadgets. So I'm gonna show you real quick. Since talking doesn't do very, do it much justice, I'll show you the, let me resize my browser. All right, everybody can see that okay? Kinda? So Rave is a, you know, it's a simple web app. The, this is the default portal layout. It can have different kinds of layouts. This portal layout ha allows you to have multiple tabs. Um, and you can create, the users can create tabs. Each, each kind of user gets their own context or tab set um, that we call pages. A couple example gadgets. So, you know, we support dragging and dropping of and persisting of the, the locations. You can minimize, maximize. We, have a context menu that you can do different things like move gadgets to different pages, delete it off the, the, the page, all those fun stuff. Um, this is the open gadget API. So this one's kind of something that uh, I really like to see. A lot of we take advantage of this a lot in internal to MITRE. But you can open a, that same gadget in a different view. So the, I'm here, I'm opening it in the sidebar. You can pass context back and forth as you launch it. So. Right, so I can sit there and you know pat, set, send that back down to the client or to the other gadget, and all of this is fundamentally open social gadgets are, are iframes, right? So this is all happening across an RPC layer, so that you know it's all abstracted, so you don't have to to deal with it. Dialog, same type of thing, and uh, modal are pretty much the same thing right now. I don't think we have too much difference between the two, but you could if you wanted to. We're working to kind of break out some of the client side UI, so it's even more extensible. Um, same thing with Canvas, right? So Canvas lets you open it in kind of a, a maximized view. And you can go change different views with parameters, send it back home. And then example of, uh, so if I subscribe in this widget to the, to the channel and I publish it here, you can see, you know, client-side communications across an open Ajax hub. So that one's kind of fun. You, we get to do some fun things. And Biter, we actually use that for control flow. Um, we enable and disable edit modes based on that, and it's kind of neat to see just all of it instantaneously pop. Uh, Rave also supports, like I said, the widget store. So you can come in here, rate your widgets, you can comment on them, add them to your page. So if I wanted to add uh, you know, the current schedule, I could see who's using it. Search for different widgets in the store. Pretty simple admin interface, so you can manage your users, the widgets, you can set different properties on them and control whether they're published or not to the, to the wider user base. Set some portal preferences. And then we also have a, a profile view, which we had a big discussion at the hackathon about how we kind of make this a little bit more generic and, and than it is today. But the profile view is, um, kind of what we use internally for MITRE for our phone book, right? So these gadgets, you can see what I wanted to demo about this is <clears throat> they, Rave has the ability to, to turn off the Chrome, to turn off the ability to, to move stuff inside of the different regions of gadgets, and it's all driven by the database, so. So that's Apache Rave uh, in a nutshell. It's 
pretty easy to, to deal with. It's not a lot of conceptual difficulty there. All right, so now the meat of the discussion, embedded experiences. So has anybody have any idea of what an embedded experience is? is? <laughs> Just raise your hand, other than Craig, right? So um, it's one of those things that's really hard to name. And when you come up with a name like embedded experiences, it sounds very buzzwordy. Um, and it doesn't really tell you what it does. But it, for, at least for what I see, it's, one of, it's a critical enabling technology for our enterprise. Um, a lot of you should have heard from your users about the too many tool problem. I have too many tools. I have to go here for this. I've got to go there for that. I've got to go, you know, like I said at MITRE earlier, we have about, you know, 200 different places to do everything. If you really, you know, count out every little tool that everybody uses all day long. And it's just impossible to, to manage all of that in an effective way. So we're looking to embed the experiences to help us that, with that. And to do that, you kind of have to embrace a stream metaphor for your business. So people are, are stream-based, right? And we get our situational awareness from a stream metaphor, you know, very easily. So stock tickers, right? We've had stock tickers forever, just, you know, flying across the board. And that's how everybody keeps up to date on what stocks are. I'm sure you can go query it, but a lot of times you're just looking up and seeing what's new. Um, email is a stream-based entity, right? So emails come in, you handle them, you manage them, you move on. Twitter feeds, Facebook timelines, all, you can think of all these different metaphors of, of how you, you interact with stream-based data today. Um, and then if you actually talk about, you know, so what am I doing now? I'm speaking at a conference, right? And if I tell somebody that, that when I go back, what did you do last week? I spoke at a conference. You're using that kind of, that event-based model to describe how you interact with the world. So if businesses and, and developers were, were to embrace this fact, then you can build applications that take advantage of the user's kind of natural model for perceiving the world. So Farmville, right? So how did Farmville get popular? Everybody started using it. It showed up in their Facebook timelines, in their, in their Facebook news feeds, and then the whole world uses Farmville now. It's a time suck for half the companies in the world. They're just charging, you know, people charging time to play Farmville. And you're starting to see a lot of applications, especially in, in enterprise, take advantage of the, the stream-based metaphor. Um, every major social network uses streams, right? So what, that's just what they do, whether it's Pinterest or Facebook or Twitter, all of them have a, a stream metaphor that they're dealing with. And business, app, business applications are starting to as well. But the business applications are doing it in isolated you know, silos. They're building the streams and the stream-based stuff for themselves. And that doesn't really help anybody. So I'm going to show you, this, this is the fun part of the demo. Listening to me talk is, is never fun. So I don't, thank you for bearing, bearing with that part. But I'm going to kind of show you uh, what a traditional social network kind of activity stream might look like, if I can get the demo to run. Um, so this is running on my local laptop that is just horribly slow, so I apologize. Actually, does anybody have a Mac charger that they could uh, throw in? All right. Yep. All right, so right now I have no activities in my, in my stream. All right, so starting a love story here. And this is gonna be kind of a traditional, you know, social networking <coughs> interaction model for, for, for streams. Um, so what you're gonna see is Mario here. You know, Mario here gave a product to Jane Doe. So, you know, a, a, We'll talk a little bit more about activity streams as a format, but you know, gave, you know, gave some flowers to his friend. Jane said, let's go out, right? So she, she had an event. Mario said, awesome, we're gonna go, to, go out, this is great. Um, and you can kind of see how this, whole plays, this all plays out in this, this canonical user's stream view. So he's keeping, you know, he's keeping track of what's going on here. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you know, for what, however, I don't know he did, but you know, Mario satisfied uh, Jane, which Canonical said that that's just, you know, not appropriate. We, we can't do that here. Um, phrasing, I think is what he said, right? So, uh, and then Jane Doe cut off all ties, ties with John Doe, right? Um, activity streams are awesome, but they apparently ruined her marriage with John Doe, so. <laughs> but you can kind of get the feel for how, yeah, granted that was in an accelerated time, but you watch that, oops, I think I hit too many enter keys. Um, but you watch that, that 
that kind of whole play out, you know, if you took that over the course of a week, right, you could watch that whole scenario play out inside of your, your activity stream and, you know, t Facebook or, or any social network that you have. All right, so I'm going to flip back a bit and not hit the IDE, which I just opened. But So that's a, that's a very common pattern for an activity metaphor, right, that you see in acti activity streams today. So what we want to do is, inside of business, is take advantage of that same paradigm. And the format that we were pushing that in is, is activity streams in terms of the specification. So activity streams is a neat little spec that defines a semantic way to describe activity data. Um, and let me see if I can actually pull it up correctly here without opening the ID. So in this case, it's the JSON representation of it, but can you see it all? Yeah. So activity streams as, as a specification just defines how you format data for, for an activity. Um, you know, you have an actor, right? That actor is the thing that is, is doing the activity, right? So there, when it was John Doe, he was, or Mario Rossi, Mario Rossi sent the flowers to Jane Doe. Right? So he was the actor, she was the, the object in that in that particular, um, or the flowers were the, the object and then she was the target. So you have an actor, you have a, the object, you have target, and then you know, kind of a short description is the content and then a verb, right? So they, you post is the default one, there's other verbs obviously like satisfy, um, and another you know, hundred or so that, you could, that are possibly usable. And actually the gadget that you just saw that, that processed that activity stream, um, doesn't actually have any, you know, beforehand data about any of these activities, right? It doesn't know how to, to represent them. And they're literally represented in the format just this way. So then it's able to sit there and parse it and say, okay, I've got an actor, they took some, ob you know, some action via the verb against some, some object, and then I can put it in the target. So you can really kind of put together systems that, that have a semantic understanding of this data. So that's the, the format. It's, um, it's pretty useful, right? So Open Social used to have its own activity data format. And when activity streams and specification was written, everybody in the community said, why are we doing this? Let's just use that, because it's better. So from a business perspective, you know, we want to be able to take advantage of this stream, right? So if we're gonna, if we're gonna produce all of this and, to, and really kind of embrace the fact that the stream metaphor is useful for a human in terms of providing situational awareness, we want to now be able to, to take advantage of the fact that we have users looking at the stream to drive functionality into their, their current context. So information aggregation is never good enough, right? So portals are kind of going away, I don't, in case anybody is, has not noticed. Portals are dinosaurs, you know, big portlets or big, you know, gadgets that do nothing but pull together RSS feeds and show information are fairly useless, useless, useless to your average user because they may look at it once a day. Right? Your average enterprise user is not going to sit there all day long and keep up to date via their portal. What you want to be able to do, though, is allow them to work through that environment and provide them real tools and functionality. So you can do that by writing gadgets that are useful. That's a good way. But you can also take advantage of the stream to inject functionality into it. So you need to be able to deliver that functionality to the user inside of that ag aggregated view in some form or fashion. And then you need to allow people who are creating activities, especially in the distributed enterprise, to be able to put their own functionality in so that you as the enterprise you know, IT shop or integrator don't have to write all the functionality yourselves. Right? So you want to rely on them to, since they know what their data are, is, they know what their data is, they know what the, service that they, the services they have are, you can allow them to actually write their own gadgets and put it in. So this is where open social embedded experiences come in. Open social embedded experiences are an extension to the activity stream spec that are part of the open social specification that define a, a separate context for, for de delivering gadgets. So all you do is you reference the gadget URL that you want to render, and you also give it the, the initialized, or the context that you want to, to have that gadget have at startup. Um, and then the container is responsible for launching it. Uh, it's pretty easy to do, right? So this is a very simple, I'll show you exactly in the spec how we're doing it, with, or in this demo how we're doing it with the JSON. Um, but it's also 
usable in email, right? So the IBM guys went out and the Lotus guys went and registered a MIME type for, did they end up doing a registering a MIME type? Yeah, so the, the because their new social business application for notes takes advantage of, of activity streams and open social to render gadgets inside their email client. So you can now, you can send them an email or you can send, or it can show up in their connections feed. Either way, you're able to take advantage of the gadget. So what this looks like from a, from a data perspective is, so you see all these, the, everything up here below or above open social is all standard activity streams. And then there's just a spec um, a extension here for open social. So you, you have an embed property, you tell it which gadget you want it to do, you tell it how, you give some container hints on how you want that embedded experience to be displayed. So if you want it to be a, a link text uh, and it says add comment, otherwise the, the container is gonna you know, render whatever the default is for that particular container. And then you want to give it some context. So in this case, like this, for this first gadget, it's a, it's an, the context is a URL comment author. The, it's an arbitrary context and it's up to the person producing the stream uh, or this, the actual activity entry to provide the context to the container. So what this looks like in Rave then um, is, now Rave has, has these other little links in the activities. So where before, just the straight activities, you didn't see anything. Now Wave says, hey, you know, I want you to, I want you to let you know, as a user, you have the ability to, to do more with this particular piece of information than you did before. So in the case of this, you know, canonical user posted a, a photo um, at his photo album of Boston, as seen from the Charles River, you can add a comment. So what this looks like, again, my laptop's a little slow today. Waiting for localhost, that's never a good thing. Um, so what this means is this is a whole separate gadget that was just launched, right? A whole separate application um, where I can actually start to add a comment or see other people's comments for this particular picture. So now if you look at this, Rave itself knew nothing about the gadget other than it existed and it was published and allowed to be rendered. That's the only two things that it cared about. All the functionality for this was the stream producer gave it the context and put the activity stream entry in and then wrote the gadget for taking advantage of it. So now, you know, whereas a, you, you could do this with your own application, and eTwitter does this to some degree with, with some of the content that they, they come through, but it's all custom handling, right? Oh, this is an image, this is a video, you know, this is something else, I'm gonna do this here. The container itself, or the, you know, in Rave, the main UI, had nothing to do with the functionality of the gadget itself. And that's really powerful, because that's a cool new metaphor for interacting with your users. So if I say here, this is a horrible picture. All right, Com some, you know, comments submitted. And I close it out. Your user just interacted with some piece of, of content and never had to leave their context. So I can do that again with a, you know, a video, right? So I'm gonna slide out a video here. Um, I'm gonna watch the video, I can add a comment on it. Again, this is a whole YouTube gadget that you know, wasn't written by the Apache Ray project, wasn't written by anybody other than, I think it was the IBM guys actually that ended up writing it. Um, I can play my video and add my comments and then go back to what I was doing without ever leaving that context. And I have to find the X button, it's over here. So what does that mean from a business perspective, right? So watching videos and commenting on pictures is not very compelling. Hopefully it shows you a little bit of an example of how you could start to build applications that could take advantage of this. And especially, I don't know if any of you caught you know, Craig's presentation earlier on Apache Streams, but what, what MITRE's trying to do is, is have a whole bunch of public publishers of activity streams inside the enterprise. SharePoint, um, you know, ELG, all these other you know, tools that we use. We want to be able to push activities in from any one of those endpoints, have them aggregated and delivered to our, our users on the portal. A great example of a business case here is, you know, so Jane Doe submitted um, a page, and it's her comment, her time, or her time sheet for approval. Uh, any of you who are, are managers that have to, to manage time sheets, you know that this is a common case. Your, your employees charge time, you have to approve it before you can move on. Now, normally the way this works is you get some email notification, you have to go over to another application, or you have to remember on a Monday that you have to do that. But if it just pops up in your stream, and I can sit here and say, oh, I'm gonna view, my, view the time sheet, and Hopefully the gadget loads, right? So, right. So I can see. Okay, so you know we use Clarity in case anybody didn't notice, right? <laughs> um, 
you know, I'm going to sit here and say, okay, so Jane Doe, she charged eight hours, eight hours. Okay, she's all set. I'm going to go ahead and approve it, right? Um, very simple, right? I, again, immediate interaction with the, the content source back to her job. So if, you don't, if you're not just sitting on a portal, but you have, say, a, you know, what we're putting together next is a project leader dashboard, where our project leaders have all the information they have to, to manage about their projects, their, the, the time tracking, the project information that they deliver you know, for the metadata about the project and, and all the tracking information, all the, the, what we call the quality workflow, um, and also any artifacts that that project produces. Right? If you can give them a dashboard that, based on widgets that is able to interact with all of that stuff and also a stream of information when things happen. Right? So there, somebody charges something on a project or somebody needs travel approval or somebody has you know, made a comment on a particular document that they're getting ready to produce. If you can do all that and deliver that, that via the stream, now you can actually start to let them interact from one interface and not have to jump around to 50 different tools. So that's, that's kind of the power of, of the embedded experience. So that's pretty much it. Um, so we'll move on to questions. But a couple of resources first, if I can click without opening random applications. So Open Social, right? So Open Social's got a, a brand new website. They're always looking for more people to get engaged. Um, activity streams, check out the specification, Apache Rave, and get it on our mail list. But any questions? I'm talking to like the four people who, who so, don't already know the stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Have you seen any signs of early adopters in, let's say, Agile. Yeah, so um, activity streams, I think you, you heard earlier, activity streams are embraced pretty heavily by Atlassian, so across a lot of their products. Um, this type of model allows you to deliver Atlassian activities and, and gadgets through a different interface, right? So if you had a project leader dashboard, you could have it right there. Um, I don't know of any others that are directly using the activity streams format, but there are a ton that have APIs. And where, where there's an API, there's an ability to, to really stand up this integration in a lightweight manner. All you need is something that's able to look at what's changing inside of it, either get event notifications of when stuff changes or pull for events, and then push it into your, your activity stream from there. Go ahead, Andrew. Question. Yep. So Rave, absolutely not, because Rave is very spec-based, right? So it's an open source project. There are uh, certain containers, like Jive, where they have specific APIs that are only available to that container. Um, so the general recommendation is use defensive programming, right? You know, test to see if a Jive library exists before you go for it, and provide something useful if, in case it doesn't. But there is a big push to try to get people to use the default stuff because, like, like you said, right, so the another thing, uh, one thing to keep in mind too is the embedded experience gadget that you, you know, you saw all those gadgets, those don't have to be only used for embedded experiences, right? You could deliver them as regular functionality. So say the time card approval, right? I have to, I don't want to have to write a time card approval EE gadget, or EE is short for embedded experience, so here you're not Java EE. Um, I don't want to have to write a, a time card approval EE gadget and also have you know, a time card approval gadget on my page too, right? and make them two different things. They can be the same thing. That's, that's what's awesome about this is you know, you just, it's a context check. Do I, have data, do I have bootstrap data or not? If I do have bootstrap data, use that. And otherwise, go to my API and find out what approvals have to be done. Um, so that's where you can get that reuse capability across all of the different interfaces that you have. And so at MITRE, we're going to have like three or four different Rave instances. So three or four different open social containers running. Um, and there's also, you know, potentially 
places where we have just shindig running and not rave, right? But all of them use the same programming format, all of them use this the model, and all of them use gadgets, so they're able to do the same thing. So that's pretty, that's pretty neat. So a good takeaway, at least for me, is that Ray is a good example of a standards-based container that demonstrates the functionality of these things. Right. Um, yeah. At least we're hoping so. <laughs> it, it shows what's possible. Right. So. Yeah, it's not a very good diagram, but it is a diagram, sure. Could you give some more details as to uh, what are the roles of each component? Yep, so... How um, do they deploy and how do they interact? Which runs the browser, which runs the server? Sure, no problem. So Rave, um, the web application, run, it, you know, it's just a war. And it has you know, a persistence layer, some common services that, that do the layout management and how you, know, you see the widgets on the page. Um, it has an API that we're, we're going to be shortly expanding on, right? and then a UI layer that's, that's there. And then this open social client <laughs> is literally just a, a provider that does nothing but map the pieces of, or map to the pieces of uh, Shindig that are necessary to render the gadgets. So one of them is a security token, right? So it generates security tokens for, for Shindig. Another thing it does is, is get metadata and cache it on the Rave side um, for those gadgets so that it can pre-populate it in the common container. None of that is really important, but it's, it's very simple and lightweight. <coughs> Shindig is another web application. It can live anywhere, right? So these two, Rave and Shindig don't have to be, they just only have to be network accessible to each other, right? They don't have to live anywhere in a common location. Um, and then the Rave has a Shindig persistence uh, layer that maps to the, the Shindig SPIs. Right, so that's, that's kind of what that's trying to show. Um, and then there's a whole, Shindig itself is really two different minds. It does gadget rendering and open social APIs. Right, they're two different things. Um, but they, they both exist in the same web application. And then the client runtime uh, is, theoretically, you could build any client runtime or hopefully soon build any client runtime once we have some done some rework on the APIs on the Rave side. Uh, but in this case, that's the client runtime runs in the browser. So this is all JavaScript. The Shindig common container is a JavaScript file that gets pulled out of Shindig. Um, and then the <coughs> Rave social provider is again a del you know, the delegated provider for mapping the common container to all of the Rave UI pieces. So like Rave has abstracted all of that open gadget, op open pop-up stuff that you saw that, that you can do through the through the open social APIs, Rave has a, a container level abstraction of that. So any JavaScript running in the page can kick up a new pop-up, can kick up a new slide out. Um, but what it does inside of that is, is up to the provider. In this case, the Rave open social provider. <coughs> Excuse me. And then it's got some API wrappers and some core JavaScript to, to manage the widgets on the page. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any more questions on it? And like I said, it's not a good diagram, but it is a diagram. Quick question. Yeah. So the, could you go into a little bit more detail about the authentication at all? Like is, it, is it gadget by gadget, or is there something in the container that's maintaining the state? Yeah. So the way that authentication works is the web app, the very web app is, at, has a, is authenticated, right? So users log in to that web app. And then <clears throat> if for the open social case, what happens is there's a security token that gets, it, and all that really is, is it's a symmetric encryption, right? So that there's a pre-shared key between the Rave web app and the Shindig web app. And the container will take a, what they call a, a token, which is, just, you know, it's a data, you know, a property bag, right? And it has the person who's viewing it, the page, the person who is own, the owner of the page, um, some properties about the page, and then the container name. And then it takes all of that and encrypts it and sends it across as a <coughs> along with the gadget to Shindig when it renders it. And then Shindig's able to say, so then for any authenticated API call, like to get person or to put activity streams in, it, that token will go with the call and then it's able to, to figure out, okay, well this is the, the owner is and you're, right? Those two 
widgets have a shared understanding of the data, or do they each identify? Each gadget can see who the owner and the viewer are of the page, right? So owner being the, <coughs> so they get that, they can have that through the Open Social API. How does this work then, or how would that be extended then if you are getting a stream um, that potentially is an aggregate of a couple of users? And, and let's say, so taking the yep. time card thing, if you were getting a list of all the people whose time cards have been submitted in a sort of an aggregate stream, and you actually have access to be able to subset of those people. Right. So that's where Apache Streams fixes that, right? So what, what you need is an, an activity stream processor who's going to give you the activities back that you can see. In the case of this example, we, it, you know, of the example code inside of Shindig today, or Rave Shindig, it, the, the repository just goes out and queries anybody that you're connected to. So that's why in this example, you can only see your activities or activities for people that you're connected to. since. Since Canonical is connected to Jane, to John Doe and Jane, um, Jane Doe, he can see or John Doe is really the only deciding factor in this case. But um, he's connected to John Doe, so he can see the this activity entry. He's connected to Mario Rossi, so he can see this entry. He's connected to John. Um, <coughs> he's connected to to John Doe with this one as well, right? Um, and then he sees his own things. And then Jane Doe, he's connected to, so he can see that one. Uh, but in a real environment, what you'd want to have is, so, you know, like a real enterprise environment. So I'm, if I have people underneath me, right, so I'm an HR manager, I want to be able to see activities that people in, that report to me are able to produce, right? And something like an, a time card approval, that's only targeted at me, right? Nobody else should be able to see that. So, so the stream processor has to be intelligent as to the environment it's in in order to deliver the right content. So that's a very hard problem, and pretty much what we did is say, we'll move that problem over here to the stream processor. Because <laughs> that's going to be, I mean, especially when you start to talk about high volume, right? So being able to do real time, you know, essentially a lot is going to be how we index, you know, and that's going to depend on per environment. So we're going to have to have flexible index models. And, well, and especially what came up at the end of the previous talk, which was the issue of persistence. Right. Yeah. The ability to, you know, recall or replay. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's critical that we're going to have to have some persistence there. Right now, Rave persisted to uh, the database, so there's a, there's a finite number of activities that you can have before it goes kaboom. Um, if you're using the MongoDB layer, it's a different finite number, but it's still finite. <laughs> Yeah, so this is all part of it. So the first demo, I was just kind of showing Rave and what it does, right? The second demo was very much about the embedded experience, right? Uh, as long as we're talking about the same thing, right? So, so this is actually, the social page is actually just a different page inside of this person's context. So I'm logged in as a canonical user here. Um, so I come in here, all of this functionality is still available to them, and we use a lot of this. Um, but the focus of this talk was to show the activity streams integration piece. And you would call this a stream, but you would call when the user clicks on the so when they click a link, the, which the, in this case, it's a specifically an open social gadget. And right now, we don't have the ability to launch a W3C embedded experience, but there's not really anything that, that is good, would prevent that other than just making sure we have some common adapters. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so when they click the link, what's happening is the embedded experience is opening that gadget. So in this case, so, so you see here, this is probably how I'd, I'd come to you know, Canonical's profile, and I can see Canonical's activities. Right, so if I'm going to go to, to Aaron's prof profile inside of Miter, I'll see uh, something like this, the things that Aaron has done. Um, and then these embedded experiences may or may not show up depending on, you know, so that's another security term that we'll have to do, and that's very container specific. But. So as, as you uh, would be making the widgets, or we would be making, as the user would make the widget? Um, so I would think that the, Anything producing the content would probably be making widgets. Is the user, so like your example where you said Atlas. Oh uh, yeah, Lassian would could or so so I could do it for for them, right? I could write a gadget that hits their API if they don't have one. Uh, but ideally, the people who who have the data are also producing the gadgets as well. That's what I was saying. Yeah, they, they already have. They do have gadgets. So so Jira has all those things when you actually go use activity streams and stuff like that. They're all gadgets, but. 
<coughs> unless things have drastically changed, Atlassian was stuck on uh, an older version of Shindig for a while. It's the activity stream creator who also has to So and I think that from the Apache Stream side, I'd, I'd expect that, that people should be able to write modules to, to inject you know, embedded experiences and strip them out as necessary too, right? So that should be, because in MITRE, you know, while I'd love to have everybody that owns all these different systems build the gadgets, they just probably aren't. So. Apache Stream is still a Right, right. Yeah. Actually, so I, I'll show a really simple one, and then I'll show a harder one if we have time. <laughs> so this is the manifest. It's pretty. It can be as simple or as complicated as you want it to be. We're trying to push people to a more simple or a simpler, you know, gadget spec when they build them. Um, so you can see here you have a module. The module prefs kind of have all the metadata about the module um, uh, or the gadget, right? So you can have some some default width, and height, and things like that. Uh, description, author email, all those types of things would be part of that. That would be attributes on this node. Um, then I'm going to require some features, right? So I'm going to require the o, the OS API, Open Social API. I'm going to require dy dynamic height, would let, which let me lets me. Uh, call a, a utility function to automatically resize the gadget iframe based on the content. Um, and then embedded experiences, right? Because I want to be able to, to load the context. Open views because I want to be able to kick off a new thing. <laughs> then you define content areas. Um, so there's some other attributes you can go in here too. So you can define your OAuth services. You can de define preloaded images and content and all that kind of stuff like that. There's, you can define API calls that get called when the gadget's rendered and stuffed into the data context before it gets to the client side so it doesn't have to make an AJAX call. All, all sorts of other next steps beyond just this. Uh, but then the content piece is the, the critical you know, step for the views, right? So, so Open Social has different, the concept of different types of views. So you can have an embedded view, default view, home view, profile view, these types of things like that. And you can have multiple content sections, each one that, that you know, matches a set of views. Um, and then in this case, what it's doing is it's referencing the time, you know, at just a simple HTML file that's like really simple, right? So in this case, this HTML file has a you know calls the utility the onload handler to press the function to get started, and this is the this is really how you're getting at the the e, e data, right? So it's got a, a listener for e data, um, and then that gets called to get act that data out, which is the, the what gets passed in the initialization of the gadget. So this is where if you have the same gadget that's doing time card approvals, you probably have. Uh, you know, something that, that checks to see if there's actual context or not and then goes off and makes an API call if it doesn't. <coughs> as you, so, as you can see, we're, we're hard coding in the, uh, yeah, this, this was a demo gadget, so um, we're hard coding in the data. Yeah, it's worth mentioning this is not what a good gadget <laughs> <laughs> This is just what a functional <laughs> 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 um, So, yeah, don't, don't, this is, you know, like, don't pay no attention to man, the man behind the curtain stuff. But. <laughs> so, basically, in this uh, HTML file, uh, I can build my app yep. using the normal stuff that I do. Right. So, you see he's got jQuery here so that he's using handlebars. Yeah. It, it's loaded into uh, an iframe? Or yep. It loads into an iframe. So, each one of these is an iframe. Fair enough. There you go. Uh, and then the additional benefit, because these are open social gadgets, you get some extra JavaScript libraries provided to you to do gadgety things, ways to interact with the container or with other gadgets, right? You get you get access to a JavaScript library that lets you do pub stuff if that's something you want. And the way you request those feature sets is through the module preps that he was when he was talking about the dynamically injected feature preps. Uh, basically, you declare the pieces of 
code that you want access to, and those are extra JavaScript APIs that are being provided to you, and now they're available inside your gadget. Yes. Yes. So a more complicated example of this is the the activity streams gadget. So you can still see here that it's pretty simple from the, the spec perspective. Um, I have a couple of user preferences here too that get tracked by the container, right? So in this case, you know, how often you refresh to go find new activities and uh, what the max number of items that you'll display are. <clears throat> and then you get into, you know, in this case, the, the this HTML file, got to remember to confuse source. It's really just a straight HTML file with um, the handlebars templates that I, I'm going to use to render out the activity data. So this is the page that loads all the gadgets? So this is the activity stream gadget. This is the one that renders the activity streams. Um, so this is, uh, these are just handlebar templates for the different ca cases in which activities can be presented. Uh, if I come back here. And then there's lots of JavaScript, right? So this is much more processing intense. <clears throat> right, so here's a lot more code in, involved in, in making it uh, display pretty. Yeah. But this renders out the activities. And then to, to give you an idea of how you can actually, so any gadget can actually create an embedded experience too, right? So it doesn't have to be part of a stream. It just makes it a heck of a lot easier. Yeah, can you set up like a WebSocket and, and connect it over? Um, Craig, have you ever set up a connect a WebSocket through the Shindig proxy? So it, it's a so I'll, I don't know. Do you guys replace your proxy or do you just run the straight Shindig one? Yeah. So so most of us do our re replace the proxy, right? So with and like IBM delegates out to their IBM proxy. They have like the Uber IBM proxy, um, but it, it is just an HTTP proxy. So if if it's allowable through a proxy, it should be allowable for the gadget. Um, I, you know, one of the things I want to do with Open Social is allow for convenience wrappers on that kind of stuff. Where I, <coughs> so we have the whole, you saw the whole data context, right? So to give you, I'll finish this and go back to the file, but so the gadgets views, you know, open embedded experience, right? So this opens the embedded experience with the, the context from the activity stream entry. Very simple, easy to handle. Um, and then you saw how it, the other file got the, uh, yeah, right. we'll go look at Aaron's awesome code again. I mean, so to be fair, Aaron, Aaron did do this in like half an hour, so. Gadgets. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you hit the rave URL, right? And so that's a web application that bootstraps the all of the Chrome, which is what we call Chrome, right? So um, all of this stuff is all Chrome. If I can get to the actual page, but um, right. So there's the rave UI pieces, right? So all of these pieces with the context menu and all that fun stuff. That that is what rave does. And then on the client side, it goes off to to, to the Shindig common container, and it you know loads out the gadgets, which essentially means hit the iframe point URL inside of Shindig, where it renders it out, and then you display it in the iframe. Yeah. So yeah. Um, but going back to the context, what I what I'd like to do. Um, so you see here, <laughs> we have this whole open social data context thing, and you can you can re register listeners on it of of different types. Um, but to really be able to drive very easily from a programming model, like that whole real-time interaction, right? So I just handle you know listeners on a data context, and I define what the I, I say in my gadget spec which service I want to pull for or to to you know hit for that data context, and then I can just you know open up a channel straight down, or I can define a a real-time you know component on my server side that says, hey, this is this is going to listen to you know. An active MQ, you know, active MQ listener, and when it gets a new message in that it wants to respond to, just send it out to the client, right, through that data context listener with an open socket. So, 
and then the, all the programmer on the, the client side has to do is just register for events in the data context, and it's all handled by decla very declaratively. So I think that's that'd be fun to do. So too heavy right now to embed, um, but that should be something that we are taking on very shortly to, to get rid of. So right now, Rave has quite a few JSPs to do stuff. Um, hopefully within the next couple of months, there will be no need for JSPs, and it'll be re you know, pure REST services and client-side templates. Potentially, I mean, you could figure that out, right? Yeah, so that's, that's Chris in the back who wants to just throw it in his OSGI container and make it all work, right? So the repositories are, are just um, interfaces that go get data, right? So it's like, go, f go fetch me data. If you want to make it a, hit a database, that's great. So right now we have two full uh, supported repository layers currently that are independent from each other, but um, there's a MongoDB layer and a, and a JPA SQL layer. We store the, yeah, really just the relationships of the widgets, how they look on this page, right? So, so in this case, the, the page has, you know, it's a sing, it tells what kind of type of layout it is. It says there's one, there's one instance of the activity streams gadget on the page, right? And here's all the preferences about that that are, that are set. So it's pretty light, light data, really. But yeah, so we're, we're going to be refactoring pretty heavily to, to support a much more embeddable model. Just HTML and yeah, five, five. So the widgets aren't stored at all by Ray. The widgets are URLs. Right. Right. Okay. Exactly. Um, so, so you have you somewhere anywhere the the widget is hosted as an XML file, and then all Ray is storing is that URL. Right. Is and that and some okay. light metadata about it. Right. So so for us, this means this is a really huge uh, for our IT ops so that we can reduce the, the complexity of deployments. Because what we have now is, you know, w with this whole model, it opens up, okay, well, we've got Rave that is pretty generic. It doesn't really care about, you know, there's not a lot to change there. So that, does, that changes very rarely. Um, and then there's the, the rest services that feed all of our corporate data, whether it be, um, you know, clarity time, you know, time reporting or whatever. Um, and then we have, gadgets and we can deploy any of those pieces independently of each other and as long as we don't break the contracts between them then then we don't have to worry about massive deployments and stuff like that it's really very very flexible very nice i mean we'll roll to production um we've actually gone to, to production with gadgets a couple times a day that, that's a really big point of value yeah. for us is getting away from because the idea is we have service providers who own their own Because if anybody's ever done a coordinated deployment before, like over a weekend, those are things to avoid with at all costs. Um, SharePoint, SharePoint has a tendency to do that, right? Oh, massive coordinated deployment. We're going to upgrade SharePoint. Damn, everybody take the weekend to get ready. So, All right, any other questions? Or are we all ready for beer? What's that? It's good. 